It's a bit of a wet day today, so this week we're going to have something slightly different. Normal running adventures will continue next week, so this week I have in mind to do a few videos talking about my road to recovery after heart surgery. I hope you'll tune in. For those of you who are a similar age to me in your 50s, I hope you do watch because this may well be pertinent to you. And for those of you who are younger, still worth a watch. Um, <laughs> if Ideally, uh, learn by other people's mistakes rather than uh, having to make all the mistakes yourself. Okay, so where do we begin? I think where we should begin is what's it like to have an angioplasty? Uh, and a stent fitted. So uh, I'm not a doctor, and so I may get it all wrong. If you have any questions about what I say today, please go and talk to your doctor about it. My aim here today is to just give you the perspective of someone who's been through it. Uh, you may be about to go through the, this yourself, and also, just as a cautionary note, really, so that um, those of you who are sailing along thinking they're all great and dandy, it's just so that you <laughs> you might be wrong. Okay, so where do we begin? Well, so if you are potentially going to have an angioplasty, you'll have been through a process so far, starting with either a heart attack or a um, chest pain. So for me, it was like someone had uh, run a spear through my back and out of my chest, and I could barely stand up. Um, <laughs> so it had clearly been creeping up for a while, but then all of a sudden it's, um, it became more of a problem. My understanding of how this works is, and again, not a doctor, you build up deposits of calcium in your arteries. Now, on the surface of it, it's hard, okay? But underneath it, you can, if you've got inflammation in your body, it can become liquid. And then if, it, if the surface layer cracks, it breaks through into the artery and you get this sort of loose, fluffy stuff that fills the artery and then you're in real trouble because your heart doesn't have enough... Um, blood getting through. That's what happened to me. So, yeah, the process. Okay, back to the process. So if you if this is you, you'll have had chest pains, you'll, you'll have been limited in your mobility, you'll have been to see the doctor. So I went, uh, I was in hospital, they decided not to do it. It wasn't bad enough, I guess. So they didn't do it there and done. Then they referred me to the rapid access chest pain clinic which they said was going to take two or three weeks and I got worse and worse after I'd been in hospital and I was in bed uh, but it actually took 10 weeks and then after I'd been there then they said yeah we're going to do two tests so the two tests they do is uh, an angiogram it's basically an ultrasound of your heart where they can look for you know things like your yeah, aorta has expanded or they could look for uh, physical problems with the heart. So in my case, they discovered I have another thing. I've got a um, bicuspid aortic valve, which basically means the, the valve on the aorta should have three flaps. Um, two of mine are fused together, so I've only got two flaps. Um, that's an aside. Anyway, so you'll have an angiogram, and then they will do a CT scan, which basically feels a bit like... Um, being inside the TARDIS, uh, you, you're in this white room and they put you in this machine with like a, in a halo and then it's whirring around and they'll inject some dye into your arm, which is a bit weird. Um, what happens is that you inject this and it feels like you're going to, you wean yourself. It's like this warm feeling and then it goes, and but it passes quite quickly uh, and you'll be in the machine for perhaps 20 minutes while they scan it from every angle, it's an x-ray, I think, contrast x-ray. They look at it from every angle. Uh, so I had one of those, and it took them about, ooh, about two weeks after I'd had the 
CT scan before they got the results back. I don't know why it took so long. But anyway, once they did, then everything sped up because the results weren't good. So let me, I'm taking this very seriously and you should too. So enjoy your 20s, 30s and 40s. Everything works. But when you get to your 50s, the check engine light can come on. And you've got to ask yourself at that point, do you want to live? Do you want to be 70 or 80 years old? Because if you do, you're going to have to make changes. The doctors can only do so much. Um, and yeah, effectively, you are in the v very first stages of heart failure. You know, so you, you, you get basically you, you get um, the heart disease is blocking your arteries. Then it can lead to the valves not opening and shutting properly. And then you start getting edema and your ankles swelling. Uh, and the next thing you know, it you're you're in a downward spiral. So the minute you know there's a problem, you want to take action. Let the doctors do their thing. But then the rest is up to you, which is why this is about a road to recovery. OK, so let's talk about my results. So I'll, let me read this to you. Um, he was seen at the Rapid Access Chest Pain Clinic and went on to have a CT coronary angiogram, which showed a calcium score of 659. Divided as left main stem 50, LAD 398, circumflex 39. RCA 172. LMS showed mild luminal stenosis in the distal segment. The most significant was the lad with mixed morphology plaque in the proximal segment causing severe stenosis. Okay, so what on earth does that mean breaking down into English? Because you'll have a, probably have seen a letter like that. So basically what they're saying is this is the CT scan that is really shown them there's a problem and that that coronary score from what i understand you really wanted the whole thing to be a hundred or less so mine at 659 that's bad and then it breaks down into the different arteries um, most of mine uh, the rca is a little high but the real bad one is the lad okay that's the lateral anterior descending and so that artery is the largest artery. And so if it blocks, you are going to have a, you have a heart attack and it's typically fatal. It's what they call a widow maker heart attack because that artery supplies 50 to 60 percent of the blood to the heart. And so if it blocks, you have a heart attack. There's just not enough blood for you to survive it quite often. And people just drop. So I've been incredibly lucky that that artery was severely blocked, but that I didn't have a heart attack. OK, so and basically they're talking about stenosis. Stenosis basically means that it's blocked up and they're talking about this mixed morphology plaque. I think what they're again, not a doctor, but what I think they're talking about there is this sort of stuff that's you've had this. It's been building up and then it's broken through and then all of a sudden blocked that artery, which is why I went from running up mountains to all of a sudden. I recall I recall the week I, I'd been out for a run. I had chest chest pain, oh, horrible pains in my arms. Then chest pain had to stop and walk home. And then I realized I was going to have to go to hospital because I was I had massive pain in my arm. And I couldn't pick up a cup of tea or think, you know, I'd lost all the strength in my left arm. <laughs> so, um, but following that, yeah, it got worse after I'd been in hospital. I got home and I could barely move. And I had to go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription. And I remember it vividly. I had to part, I only had to walk past four or 500 yards from the car, but it must have taken me half an hour. And there was a lady. She must have been 90 uh, with a Zimmer frame and she was moving at least twice as fast as I. She overtook me. <laughs> that's that's how much I was debilitated by it. OK, so. Um, 
yeah, frankly, you read a letter like that, and then you're going to look it up, aren't you, and see what it means as a layperson. And it's a serious problem. So you've had those two tests, then they immediately go, we need to get you in. At that point, they're going to want to do an angiogram. So let's take it from there. Your day in hospital, because you might have a day in hospital coming up yourself. You are going to end up in a room with people of about your age. You are going to look sheepishly round at each other, uh, wondering if you recognise uh, each other from the queue at the pie shop. And you're, you're not, not all of those people are going to have the same thing, uh, but most it's so they're, they're all there to have that test. So it might be that they've got a this chest pain. It might be that uh, they need a pacemaker or something. You know, they're there for slightly different reasons, but most of them it's heart disease. So the first thing they'll explain to you, which can be it was a bit of a shock to me because I didn't know anything about that until I got there. The doctor says, look, we're going to do this test, but we only do it if we absolutely have to uh, because there's a risk. So he's he told me that um, the risk of doing the procedure was, I think he said, 0.01% of death. Now that made my ears prick up. <laughs> but then he said, if we then have to go on to put a stent in, then um, the risk of death rises to about 1%. And that, you know, obviously at that point, I'm there, I can barely move. You, you, you've, you are delighted to be there at that point, frankly, because you're looking at, you know, if they don't do something, you're not going to be here very much longer. Uh, so, but yeah, that's that's quite scary. So as you sit there, you'll see people go in and come back. So some people, for instance, they start by, I'll go through the whole procedure, but they start by injecting the dye in. And some of them, they'll just inject the dye in and look, and it's all fine. So they never actually carry on with the procedure. And you get people come back a bit disgruntled because they haven't had, they actually had the procedure done. But that's because it's the, the, the risk of the procedure. Okay. And some people, they'll come in and they'll put a stent in. Some and come, they'll go and come out. Some people, they'll come out and they've not had it done. And the reason for that is when they've looked, they've seen that the, the blockage is so extensive that a stent is just not going to cut it. They're going to have to do a heart bypass. So I'm just preparing you. You might go in thinking this is all going to be sorted today and it's not. Okay. Um, so in my case, what happened? <laughs> Actually, was the, I was the first to talk. There was a group of us, about perhaps eight of us waiting. Uh, and they, the doctor called me first, but they'd lost my blood work. They call you in for a pre-op the week before and um, to take blood but they'd lost the blood work so they then had to take more blood and I had to sit while everybody else in the room went through the procedure and I was the last one standing waiting to go in um, anyway but eventually they call you in and you walk to theatre um, you get to the door and they you take your shoes off and you go in you're in a gown, so basically they take you, you, you take strip the top off. They put you in a gown, walk you down to theatre. At that point, then you're on the gurney and into this room with the, where they do the procedure. Uh, what do they do first? Well, they at the pre-op, they'd said to me that um, the only bit that's painful is the injection to numb the area. It's like a bee sting. And I thought, I've had some nasty bee stings over the years. But that is nothing. I didn't feel that at all. So they start by making it. I don't know if you can see on my wrist there. They make an incision. It's about, it was about half a centimetre long on my wrist. And they 
well, actually, first they start with the die. So they inject the die. Then they go, right, we are going to carry on. So they make that slit. They, they inject the area to numb it. They make a slit. And then they run wires up your arm through to the chest so that they can take their pictures from all angles. Okay. Uh, and I won't lie to you. That wasn't pleasant. Um, I was quite surprised, actually, because I'm thinking, surely there are no nerve endings inside your blood vessels, but it wasn't pleasant. So they start by giving you a, something to relax you, I think. I think probably diazepam they gave me. And uh, But they start feeding the wire up your arm. And I must have dainty blood vessels, I guess, because it... Um, it was getting stuck and it was rubbing and you could feel it. They were having to force it at the elbow and I could really feel it going up. And it was, it was really quite uncomfortable. So at that point then they gave me a much larger dose of whatever it was they gave me. And at that point you, you're more relaxed, but it was still, I, I was able to, to, to endure it then, but uh, it was still wasn't pleasant. And you are there. They were at it for 20 minutes, running the wire up, pushing, pulling, doing their thing. OK, at that point, then surgeon's head appears at the end of the bed and says, I can, I can see why you're in a lot of pain. We need to do something about it right now. And... Um, if anything, that was a relief, though I was still, yeah, I'm, I'm a congenital coward, you know, but uh, it had to, had to be dealt with. So th at that point, then what they do is through that incision in, in your um, in your wrist, they then run a folded up stent. Now, I believe stent te technology has come on. They used to be just a tube. Whereas now they're a spiral. I believe the I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but my understanding is the early ones, you have problems over time with them clogging up at either end. Uh, and a spiral apparently works better. Anyway, so they, they run this thing in. Uh, from your pers perspective, you know, you'll feel it going up and in. And then they're obviously extending it, making it larger to fit, because obviously they've got to get it in the right place and open up the artery up as wide as possible. Because, uh, yeah, I can imagine if it were to move, that would probably kill you. I don't know, but it uh, wouldn't be good. So they're there. You, they spent a considerable portion of time um, going... Another extender, another extender. Can we get it a bit bigger like this? And you can feel, you can feel that. You can feel pressure and you can, you know exactly where it is, where they're putting it. You can feel it. Um, until they, they carry on until they're happy. And then they'll show you the screen and they can, they'll show you what it was like before. And they show you afterwards. And so basically, in, the, in my case, this it was this the lad, the lateral anterior descending, right at the very end, it was blocked. There was no flow at all. And I assume at the aorta end. And then afterwards, they show you and it's all flowing. And uh, so then they wheel you out. You don't have to walk out of the surgery. They wheel you through to the ward and they sit you there in the ward. Now, the reason for this, one thing I didn't mention is the first thing you do when you get there in the morning is they're going to give you some tablets, some blood thinners, uh, because they, you know, and after you've had the procedure, you, you need blood thinners afterwards. We'll talk about that. Um, so... You, you sit in the ward, onto the ward in a bed and they just monitor you there for an hour or so, you know, make sure you're OK. And they'll give you something to eat at that point because you won't have eaten that day prior to the procedure, you see. So at that point, then you're going to get you're going to get a sandwich and some juice. And at that point, if you're anything like me, there'll be a feeling of elation because you, <laughs> they fixed it. 
You can feel it there. It's raw, but they've fixed it. OK, so um, let's just talk. So at that point, then, you, they keep you there for, I think, four hours. Um, and the reason being is that you can bleed. So when you come out, you'll have a clamp around your wrist where that thing is. Because they're giving you all the blood thinners, you're not going to clot. And so you could bleed. And so what they do is they put this clamp on you to clamp it shut. And it stays there. Um, well, actually, it stays there. I think you wear it home, don't you? I think I can't remember now. I can't, it is a few months ago. Uh, anyway, so you, you sit there with this clamp on until they're sure you're not going to bleed. Uh, and then then they let you go home. And, you know, I can't remember. With, I think you, they took it off and they just put a dressing on it. Yeah, that's what happened. So they've, you've got this clamp on. After four hours, they take it off and then they put a dressing on it and then they send you home. Uh, obviously, someone has to come and pick you up. You can't drive and you can't drive for a week after the procedure and they'll send you away with some more blood thinners and you have to take blood thinners every day um i think about for about six months i'm still on them now so my procedure was what the end of november and it's now march and i'm still taking them uh so when they send you away to recover uh they say you can return to normal activity after about a week uh, though I don't, when they say normal activity, I'm not sure they mean my sort of normal activity, i.e. running and weight training. So uh, it took slightly longer than that, but we'll get to that in another video. Um, anyway, um, right. I think the other, fa other thing to talk about is medicine. So, um... What medicine was I given? So when I first, when they first went to the, saw the cardiologist, they started me on a um, mono mill, which is a nitrate, uh, time release nitrate. Basically, what that does is open up the arteries. When they started me, though, they only gave me half a tablet, and obviously, and it didn't really make that much difference. Um, once they re once they had the CT scan, they gave me a much larger dose, and um, that did make me feel I could move a lot around a lot better. Basically, because that tablet is opening up your arteries wide, and I'm still taking that now, and I suspect I will be taking. I don't know, I may be taking that forever. Um, so that's one. Uh, other tablets they gave me they. Apparently, they often give beta blockers to s slow the heart, but they couldn't give them to me because my heart rate was so low already. My, um, you know, my resting heart rate is less than 50 beats a minute. In the night, in fact, it goes down into the 30s. So, yeah, that wouldn't be good, giving me something like that. But they did give me something else, which also retards the heart a bit. It's called... Adizem. Um, that's another thing they gave me. Obviously, they give you this, uh, um, aspirin because that helps prevent heart attacks. So you're going to have to take an aspirin every day. And again, I suspect that'll be for the rest of my life. Um, what else did they give me? The other issue I had was this um, bicuspid aortic valve. And so the, 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 the danger with that... Apparently, say not a doctor, is that um, well, one they tend to f start to fail when you're about in your fifties, uh, and then if the valve isn't open and closing properly, then you can get an enlargement of the aorta, and it can lead to either an aortic aneurysm, which will kill you, or you or an aortic dissection, basically where the aortic swells, and it, then it rips the wall of the aorta. And that, again, that is very serious. So I now wear, basically, I for blood pressure, 
I was already on Ramipril, and now I've got this the Adizem on top of that to help. And then I've got what's the other one I've got? I also take a water tablet as well. The largest thing that impacted my blood pressure, though, was the monomil, the the nitrate tablet to widen the arteries. That really brought my blood pressure down. And so anyway, I I now wear a constant blood pressure monitor uh, because because of that issue with the heart valve. um, I can't afford my blood pressure to ever get too high because it... It could be dangerous. So HIIT training, for instance, is probably a thing of the past. Not that I was ever a massive fan of HIIT training. But um, uh, I wear it so that I know that when I'm running or doing weight training, that I know that my blood pressure never gets too high. Uh, and so far, so good. It looks pretty good. So that's the medicine. I oh, think any other things that um, happened. I developed an uh, an abnormal heart rhythm. This happened before the procedure. So as, after I was debilitated, I was fine. But after I'd been debilitated for perhaps two months, I started to get um, quite often in the early evening, at the end of the day, this feeling of pounding in my chest, uh, it just and it didn't feel right. It felt weird, like um, I can't quite des- describe it really, but it was a, an uncomfortable feeling. And um, I've got an Apple Watch, uh, which has got an ECG on it. And yet, when you do that, run the test. When it felt weird like that, my heart was pumping in the wrong order. It says inconclusive on the Apple Watch. But basically, you got the, it should go ba dum ba dum, and it's going ba dum ba dum ba dum. There was a whole extra thing, and apparently, it's to do with the heart beating in the wrong order, the electrical signal going the wrong way. That does seem to be getting better now. Um, probably, I don't know. Probably because of this restriction of blood flow to the heart. So, um, where should we leave? So, I hope this hasn't scared you to death. If you need it, they will look after you. They will fix it. Having done it, though, what we'll talk about in the next video is if you if you don't want it to come back, you're going to make, have to make lifestyle choices. So before this procedure, I thought I was all doing really well, frankly. You know, I'm in my 50s. I run regularly. I weight train. Um... Careful, I, you know, I was on a very low carb diet, which is the only thing that frankly controls my weight, and thought everything was fine. And clearly, it wasn't. It's a shame, really, that they don't do that. I don't know that perhaps it's risky. I don't know. That CT scan was quick and simple. Um, and it, I wish that I'd been given one of them five or 10 years ago, really. Because you would have never got to that stage, you'd have. It's nice to see if there's an iceberg ahead, isn't it? If you can see an iceberg on the horizon through the binoculars, you, it's much easier to change course than when you're going right up to it and coming to go like that. So, and of course, I don't know what's caused this, and I never will. So, it could be that. Being on a low-carb diet, which focuses on eating fat, has caused it. It could be all the periods of time where my weight was uncontrolled, because if I wasn't on the low-carb diet, then I was a very... I could get up to 110, 115 kilos of weight very, very, very easily, and did. It could be that. It could be the... um, It, it could it could be the um, that heart problem. Apparently, the if you got that dodgy valve, it creates a turbulent flow in the aorta. Could be that. It could be um, what else? Oh, it could be the sleep apnea. I have severe sleep apnea, and I um, I now have a machine, a CPAP machine, to breathe for me in the night. 
but I've only recently had that, and so I've probably had that sleep apnea my whole life, untreated, which causes, a, you know, basically I would stop breathing 50 plus times a night with the longest period being up to a minute long in that. So, you know, I could be not breathing for half an hour, half of an, in an hour, half of that hour, I might not be breathing at all. So um, that starves the oxygen of blood and causes heart disease. So um, it could be that. But um, given where I am, I... I have to um I, I have to do whatever the doctors say basically in order to make sure that I get a bit more life. And so that's what we'll talk about next time, I think. We'll talk about um recovering from this and diet. Okay. Again, from the perspective of a layperson. Okay, I I hope that was interesting. I hope I haven't scared you all to death. Uh, but it, I think it's important because um, you may well be going through life with a problem that you're completely unaware of. Uh, if, if you have private medical insurance and you're, in, and you're in your 50s and you have the option to have a C, CT scan, go and get one. Um, better to know now than... I've been incredibly lucky. I could have had a widow make its heart sack and died. Um, so it, I'm well aware of how lucky I've been. So, um, yeah, if you can get one, get one. And um, watch out for the warning signs, you know. Your blood pressure creeping up. Uh, so one of the things I notice now, for instance, is running up a hill. I used to think, oh, running uphill's hard work, isn't it? That's because I'm running uphill. And now I can run up, I run up a hill and it, it isn't tight there. So if you are going, if you're exerting yourself and you're getting tightness in your chest, take that as a warning sign. Go and see your doctor. Um, that's it. Anyway, so that's Road to the Re Recovery Part 1, the tricky bit. The surgery. Um, next time we have a rainy day, we'll have another one of these videos. But next week we'll get back to uh, my running adventures. As you know, I love a run, <laughs> running adventure, a little micro adventure. So the days are getting longer now. So uh, it it is difficult sometimes to fit it in because I'm now having to work full time, so rigid hours. Uh, and so, like today, you know. I couldn't really film in the week uh, when it was lovely and you get to the weekend and it's not so lovely, um, but the days are getting longer. So this week, as the days are starting to get longer, I may well film one in the week. If I do, it will be closer to home because I don't, I can't physically travel too far and run and get back in time for work, if that makes sense. Or if it's the end of the day, I've run out of daylight. But I may film something in the week and then I'm, ho I'm really hoping to for a proper adventure to get back out and do some more of the coastal adventure. So if next time we it's not raining profusely at the weekend, I'll be heading back to Birkenhead. There's a hill with a great view, I believe. And then we'll be filling in that section because so far we've run all the way from Aberdaran to Birkenhead. But we have done a section from Port Sunlight down to Bromborough. So I need to fill in that little chunk. So that's that's coming up. Right, on with the day. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Take care. See you next time. <laughs>